from wherever you are. Please feel free to give in your comments or thoughts at the comment section on our Facebook page, and we will be reading them as we continue this discussion. Let me begin with you, Dio. We are in times that no one ever expected, and even as late as December 2019, people viewed COVID-19 as a disease of the people in the West, and, uh, and it would never have gotten into Kenya. And the world is facing a big financial and economic challenge due to COVID-19. Most businesses have been shut and livelihoods affected. Do you think we shall recover as a country from this pandemic? Yeah. Well, thanks, Gray. Um, so it is clearly a crisis, both economically, socially, and among other situations affecting humanity and human livelihoods. And I agree with you that uh, there's a long way to go, even in getting to manage the situations and realize that this is something we are living with. However, one thing I know for real, for sure, is that Kenyans are very resilient people. And I guess you've already seen that in a couple of weeks. We were a bit scared in March, April, by mid-April, guys were like, you know, we are not going to sleep hungry. We are not going to just stay and watch our kids who are not going to school just at home and we can provide and have three meals a day. And our great people went back to their businesses. Of course, exposed to the risk as it is, but also uh, being very keen to not sleep hungry, for lack of a better word. So for me, I think there is a long way to go definitely for us to recover. I wouldn't call it recovery and back to normalcy. I think I would call it um, the new normal, embracing the new normal and managing it. One thing I have seen around businesses that I could just mention as we go on is that I think recovery and um, getting back to normal business and economic activities does not just involve opening up of businesses and extending operating hours. I think it also involves people having confidence that they are safe in places they are working in and that they are not as exposed and as scared as it's coming out right now. So yeah, recovery is a process, but we also need to build confidence even in our health systems and also in our working environments. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll bring in Sally. Sally, uh, a similar question. The pandemic has led to a lot of job losses. Uh, companies are sending people on unpaid leave. In some instances, people are getting laid off. And uh, as we all know, the Minister of Labor has so far received very many cases and complaints, and they had even issued guidelines on what companies should do to ensure that they keep uh, their companies in operation. What should be done to cut the job losses during this period? All right, thank you very much for that question. I will tackle it in two folds, huh? from the employer's perspective and then from the employee's perspective. Huh? And uh, laws of contracts, uh, we have a clause called uh, force majeure. Force majeure, uh, basically uh, states that uh, certain acts are, can be described as acts of God. Nobody could have foreseen the pandemic as is and the effects of the pandemic and the economical, especially the economical effect of this pandemic on both the employer and the employee. Remember the Employment Act uh, um, gives remedies, rights and obligations to both parties, the employer and the employee. So um, I will implore the employers instead of um, uh, terminating contracts huh? and of course well, those who proceed to terminate these contracts should really consider section 41 of the Employment Act they can instead consider perhaps entering into new contracts or amending the existing contracts and having an addendum that um, you know will, in will incorporate clauses that will help uh, shelve both the employer and the employee during this particular time. For the employees that have been um, fired, I would implore them to pursue the constitutional rights, uh, Article 162.2 that established the Employment and Labor Relations Court. It is an equivalent to the High Court. It uh, handles matters um, that uh, touch on employment and labor relation, um, you know, complaints. Huh? That is the one area that they can, that's the one channel that they can use to perhaps follow up with the grievances. Huh? And I am also alive to the fact that the times are hard, especially economic wise, eh? and people do really do not have an income. And we all know that the services of a lawyer are quite expensive. So if 
you are in need of legal services. There are various organizations that you can approach that can offer you pro bono services that will help you follow up on a relief in terms of um, termination of employment. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll bring in now Albert. Albert, you are a psychologist and uh, you know, we are, we are in a new reality. People are working from home, there's temporary unemployment, there is homeschooling of children. There is also lack of physical contact with family members, friends and colleagues. Uh, take time to get used to. So what can people do to look after their own mental health and to help others who may need extra support and care? And as you answer that, Albert, how does this vary for parents, senior citizens, and people with existing with pre-existing medical conditions? Sorry. Wow, that's a mouthful, eh? <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I'll begin by um, by giving uh, what what one can do to ensure that they're mentally that, that they're men mentally they're healthy. And I should note that um, they are very similar in as far as parents are concerned, in as far as persons with, um, sorry, uh, mental conditions are concerned, isn't it? What was the other group? Uh, there was senior citizens and people with ex pre-existing yes, medical and senior conditions. Citizens. Okay, so now let me begin by giving you really what can one do generally. So I must begin by saying there are numerous things one can do. Um, for example, one, have a balanced diet. Okay, eat well, have a well balanced or eat protein, carbohydrates, starch, make sure it's well balanced. All right, second thing, exercise, physical exercise. And the reason why you need to exercise is because exercise is a very good stress reliever. Okay, and in addition to that, you notice when, when you do exercise, especially what are what we're witnessing now. Because one very more common form of exercise people are doing is walking. People are either walking a lot or people are running a lot. But why would you want to walk? Why would you want to do exercises? One, you want to relieve your stress. Secondly, you also want, it's also an opportunity for you to meet, pe meet people. You know, it's also a way of also social connecting with other people. Eh? So I'll encourage you to do that. Then the other thing is also sleep well. They always say at least seven to eight hours of sleep is good for somebody. Why? Because you need to rejuvenate. You need to be energized. All right? Something else, social connect. Purpose to connect with people. Don't be alone. In fact, they, I mean, right now, because, you know, we are all locked up and, you know, with all the various stresses that have, my colleagues have mentioned, this, we, are, we are very anxious. And very stressed, and it's so important to reach out, have an outlet, have somewhere, have people you can share and talk to. Something else, monitor the kind of information you're watching on the television about COVID. Know what you can take and know what you cannot take. Yeah, because there's some people who get a bit overwhelmed when they see the number of deaths. Okay, that people get overwhelmed when they see the number, not, or the, not just the number, but even the graphics, like what's happening in Kenya, what's happening out, or, or what's even happening abroad. So monitor that. Something else you want to do is also ensure you've got facts. Have your facts right about this pandemic and don't rely on rumors or myths and stereotypes. Okay, something else. Now that you're at home, and this also goes for parents, purpose to engage your children. Tell them what is going on and what is happening. Another thing, focus on positive. Focus on, on, the, uh, on the positivity. Like I always say, don't focus too much on the death. Focus on the recoveries, you know? So you need to know that, yes, as much as this is a pandemic, and as much as people are getting infected, there are also recoveries. And globally, I believe the recovery rate is about 5%. So there's need to continuously talk about that, okay? Then maybe one final thing I'd like to talk about is also the aspect of uh, self-care. Take care of yourself. Have a routine, okay? What do you do when you wake up? You know, it sounds very simplistic, but it's, it's very key. Knowing that when you wake up, you're going to wash your face, you brush your teeth, you'll then uh, maybe uh, check on your email or check on your children, have a routine that will ground you, that will give you some form of focus. Now, I want to now touch on parents. 
okay? Now, when it comes to parents, once again, the, they're quite similar. You may want to also exercise. You may also want to eat, right? You also want to uh, social connect with people. And uh, you may also want to even seek professional help when necessary. But also here, you will also want to uh, engage your children, all right? Yeah, and just talk to them and let them know what's happening. You may now also want to prioritize, you know, your, yourself and uh, what, and your issues and your activities, okay? It's, it's, it's very important, all right? Um, something else, you may also want to, once again, define yourself, all right? Remember right now, we're going through a period of layoffs and many people, unfortunately, are defined by their work, but guess what, your work does not define who you are. So per per perhaps this is the opportunity to rediscover your talents and your gifts, eh? so it's important to think about that. When it comes now to the elderly, okay, um, I'll, it's the same as I've, it's, it's, it's literally the same, but when it comes to the elderly, I want to focus on the aspect of, 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 of having a balanced diet because, because of the age. I want to also focus on the aspect of having exercises, all right? I also want to focus on the aspect of um, uh, identifying new, you know, new talents, you know, rediscovering yourself as another thing. And also the aspect of caring for others. Why do I say so? When, especially when, when cause I believe we're talking about the elderly here, we're referring to persons who are above 65 years old. Eh? So they, there's need for, for them to feel that they're, all, they're, they're also cared for, all right? <clears throat> now, when it comes now to people with uh, pre-existing mental conditions, eh, I think it's important to one, there's need for telepsychiatric and telecounseling. Secondly, there's need for them to have access to the medication. And thirdly, there's need for telepsychiatric consultation. So I feel policymakers need to look into this and ensure it actually happens. Thank you, thank you, Albert. Before I let you go, uh, I should have even started by this question. How yes. are you coping yourself as Albert during this period? In a minute. Oh, <laughs> so many things. <laughs> Number one, I have a routine. Personally, I have a routine. I exercise, all right? I'm eating well, okay? I'm connecting. I've redefined myself, all right? But above all, I am positive. My mindset is positive. And once, because I'm positive, guess what? I'm resilient. And that is what we need at this point and as we bounce forward during the post-COVID. Yes. Thank you. I'll, I'll bring in Dio. Dio, I'll still ask you the same question. As a young person during this pandemic, how are you coping as an individual before I go into your second question? Dio. I think Albert has helped me try to structure what is happening in my life in a presentable way. <laughs> I have defined a routine. Um, I have been working from home before the pandemic, at least for the last two, three years. So somehow adjusting for me was a bit easy. But then adjusting with the fact that I'm restricted has been the problem, you know, the mind. So I think I've just, for me, trained my mind on, I wake up in the morning and do a couple of things in form of a routine. But I make sure at least within two days, if not daily, I have time to go out and take a walk and stretch. And I also connect. I think um, these platforms, digital spaces for connection have been great. And once in a while, in the last couple of weeks, I've met up, met up friends to, you know, for coffee and just uh, encourage each other. So, yeah, this is very helpful, Albert. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, 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 Dio, the COVID-19 fund that was established by the government has been receiving cash injections from the World Bank, from other financial institutions, and that means that we are pushing further our debt as a country. Uh, what are some of the economic repercussions of these debts that we are getting into because of this pandemic? Thank you. Um, I think for me first, the COVID-19 situation laid bare the reality that as a country, we are not prepared for any emergency. I mean, I was very surprised that we do not even have a disaster management or kind of an emergency fund as a nation that could cushion us even for two or three days without begging, for lack of a better word. That in itself is scary. 
Uh, however, in as much as we are very happy that we are having uh, financial support, it's also a bit discouraging if I look at it critically to realize that all this financial support that is exciting some of the quarters in this country is actually credit. And whether as an individual I'll gain out of it or not, I definitely will have to contribute in one way or another in the recovery of these loans. And that I think is a strategy that for me has not been well thought of, for lack of a better word. But economically speaking, post COVID or as things tend to go down, I think that it will definitely be a heavy burden because while businesses and people and individuals will be trying to recover their current situation economically, they will be having a stronger burden or a much heavier burden in terms of recovering these loans. And I think this in a typical layman's language should be scary enough for a country like ours, which apparently we already owe tens of thousands of loans to a different number of countries like China before even you know the COVID situation. But secondly, also some of these loans under the, what are we gonna discuss, I guess ahead there, but basically the stimulus package has been allocated to some companies or business, uh, I would say business sectors. But my concern is that beyond the COVID-19 situation, there is a likelihood that one company will have received this emergency credit uh, allocations to address their liquidity needs. And if this is not done transparently against the need for every specific sector, then we are likely to end up with a very uneven playing field. Where then one company will have probably a higher liquidity, a higher you know, business operations in a typical layman's language against the other just because they did not qualify to get allocations for uh, you know, the COVID-19 credit. So I think for me, there is need for us to think as we allocate, as we think of the use of these funds, think beyond 12 months, think of the economy beyond a year to be able to ensure that regardless of which sector receives what, there will be an equal and even um, playing ground for every economic sector and every farm that has been affected. Lastly, I think we just have to be honest and start working proactively and not reactively. I think there's a lot of conversations we can have around this, but for now I will say that. Thank you, thank you, Dio. I want to bring in Sally. Yes. Sally, in the month of May alone, over 30, uh, around 30% of Kenyans were unable to pay their rents. And this is an issue that has been talked about town for the longest time now. And uh, also statistically, around 10% of landlords were not able to offer relief. To a Kenyan out there and a young person who, uh, in, in all fairness, are the ones who are facing this, this big challenge of maybe paying rent or affording rent in the city, for example, in Nairobi currently, how can they go about getting a relief from their landlords, despite them being businesses? And people would say that it's their business, they have to make profits, they don't have an obligation to, to waive or some percentage of, of the rent that is being paid. What is there any legal mechanism that exists for young people or the country at large to get reprieve around this issue? Sally. I am tempted to start this segment by saying that the law is very clear. But you all know the law is very clear. And uh, it seeks to offer relief and, uh, to both landlords and tenants. That is how the law operates. And uh, these are unprecedented times. Nobody could have foreseen the current uh, crisis that we're in. And there is no legal obligation, as you mentioned, uh, for landlords to reduce rent. As I said, the law protects both the landlord and the tenant. So what I will implore for the young people out there who are unable to meet the rent requirements, I will uh, implore them to get into an amicable agreement uh, with the landlord and come up with a way of clearing uh, the rent uh, debts. Have it in writing, I would advise. Have it in writing. And of course, honor you, you with the parts the way you commit to do that. Huh? Where that hits the wall, I will implore a tenant to seek the services of the Rent Restriction Tribunal. However, um, 
this particular tribunal uh, listens to cases, uh, uh, it has an amount, uh, it, it has a restriction uh, of matters not more than 2,500 shillings. That is where you can seek relief. For matters of uh, uh, well, more than that, they can seek relief in the high court, perhaps get an injunction to stop an eviction or something of the sort. Huh? But for now, uh, again, these are very unprecedented times. I will implore tenants to come up with an agreement, a payment agreement to the landlords. Huh? And also, of course, I implore landlords to be a bit more sympathetic to the current times. Thank you. Okay, still on the same issue. We've seen in media reports where people get evicted from houses at night, the doors are removed, some have their roofs, you know, removed by uh, by rogue people, I would call them rogue, say agents or landlords or, or, or owners of these houses. What, what kind of support can such people get? Because I've seen quite a number, I might not be sure of the exact number, but quite a number, especially in informal settlements, when you're unable to pay, the best thing that the landlord or the owner of the house does is, hey, to come and remove your, your, your roof or your door. What kind of, uh, of, of support can these people get from the trading all that you've mentioned or even just from a legal perspective? That is more of a human rights issue and upholding the rule of law at all times. Huh? Regardless of the current times, the rule of law must be upheld at all times. And as a Kenyan citizen, you have your own rights. You have a right to uh, not being harassed, you know. Uh, the, the, the law clearly stipulates the steps that a landlord should take once a tenant is unable to meet their obligations. Huh? And the obligation in this, in this particular context is meeting their rent arrears. Subjecting them to human rights violation is a huge, um, it's illegal, just to put, it, to put it bluntly, it's quite illegal. And this can be taken up by human rights um, organizations. I would implore that any victim of such unscrupulous and um, terrible, terrible, terrible uh, circumstances uh, to seek redress in law. Reports, get an OB, uh, because the human rights violation, uh, approach an institution that deals with human rights and take it up from there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sally. I want to bring in Albert to talk about an issue that has been has been top of the news over the past few days. And Albert, as as you come forward to to respond to this issue, reports by the Gender Violence Recovery Center (GVRC) and also the Directorate of Public Prosecutions, and the National Council on Administration of Justice, show an increase in sexual offenses against women since the, uh, the outbreak of COVID-19. Lockdowns, quarantine, and cessation of movement have actually uh, uh, trapped some of these women with abusive partners. And also survivors are getting it hard to report some of these cases. How can they cope with this? Albert. Okay, thank you very much for that question. That's a very good question. And indeed, um, a very unfortunate one, if you ask me, because as uh, was indicated by the health ministry, it's on the rise. And even as World Health Organization indicated that gender-based violence is on the rise. So for me, I look at two key areas, okay? Number one, I look at, um, there's something called the response path, uh, where here we look at the first thing that the GBV victim should do. One is seek health attention, go to hospital, all right? Once you've gotten that, then the next thing is report. You put it to the police, okay? Now here, we need to understand dynamics that exist. And I must say, especially in informal settlements, okay, where you find the, uh, and, and here I'll give a scenario, where you have one of the partner, man who beats the, the wife, and you may find that she may not necessarily be willing to go to the police. So what happens in that case? They call the community leader, then the community leader then goes and talks to the chief, and that's the chief who then comes and mediates between the two. So there's that other aspect. That's one aspect of it. Then the other aspect under that reporting is now going to the police. The third thing is offering of the psychosocial support. Now here you give uh, counseling, PTSD, and uh, the recommended number of sessions could be five, five or more, depending on the situation. And then uh, fourthly, it, uh, is, I'd like to look at um, something called the, 
the safe house or the safe place where they can go. So now here, um, the thing about uh, our safe houses, I believe it's normally a two, a two week period where you can go and get protection. But I think now there's also need now to perhaps engage someone, perhaps a relative or maybe a neighbor who can host this victim for a period of time where they can actually collect themselves and recover. Um, then the other thing um, is the aspect of um, uh, maybe seeking help using toll-free lines. Like I believe we've got one that is uh, one that is used. That is the I think it's eleven ninety-five, and then for children it's one sixteen. So I would look at it based on those two key areas. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Albert. I want to bring in Sally and ask the same same question, Sally. How can people cope with it? Because today in the news and in the dailies, we saw a report that over around 4,000 young girls below the age of 19 from Machakos County have been impregnated during this period. And it's because they are, they are exposed, they are at home, they, 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 are, they are these people who are, are doing some of these things to them. What, 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 what kind of support can they get during this period? Bearing in mind that we have curfews, we have cessation of movement, we have issues of police brutality, which we are going to discuss later on in this conversation. What, what needs to be done around the issues of sexual gender-based violence? Sunny. It's quite an uh, emotional and heartbreaking issue. And it's quite unfortunate that this pandemic has brought out the rot uh, in the society. Uh, the law is very clear when it comes to child interest. Children should be protected at all costs. We have two laws that govern now. Huh? This number one, the first one is the Protection Against Domestic Violence Act, which was uh, signed into law in 2015, and we have the Sexual Offenses Act in Kenya. Um, we have legal redress uh, that that um, govern this issue. So I would implore, first of all, it's a community issue. I am sure these people live within us. As a community, we know the bad apples and the rotten apples in our society. So I would implore the community, first of all, to be diligent. To be diligent in observing any kind of um, abuse, be it physical, be it sexual, be it emotional. I would implore the community to be the first people to report such matters to relevant authority the, and follow the due process of the law, not take the law to their, on their own hands because that will be breaking the law, but really follow the due process of the law. Report these matters, as um, my colleague said, the children can be removed from such um, an area and put in a safe house as the process, due process of law continues. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. I want now to bring in Dio. Dio, in your previous question, you talked about uh, the word stimulus, which is a new word. <laughs> I know it's been there in economics. I want to talk about the, the measures that have been put by government to support the vulnerable people in the country. And recently, the president uh, launched the eight-point stimulus package. What are your thoughts on these measures? And do you think enough is being done to support the vulnerable in the country? And talking about vulnerable, young people are also vulnerable to some extent, but most of the times, most of this support goes to the elderly, which is not bad in all honesty. But you find that young people also need some of these, uh, some of these measures to support them because they have lost their jobs, they are in the communities, they don't have a source of income, and they are living in the community. Young parents, for example, they have small families. What do you think needs to be done to support this demographic that is normally forgotten? Deal. Thanks, Gray. Um, first, every time I hear of a government initiative to support young people, and whatever comes up is as in Tani, casual labor, jobs, I wonder what the definition of young people means to the government. But I guess it is good that there is somebody or a number of people who thought about addressing the current situation of COVID-19 and the economic uh, crisis through the eight stimulus you know, package. I was a bit confused though exploring that eight stimulus package because some of the presentations such as something around infrastructure and health and even water and environment, for me, I thought those should be happening and not coming up as a response to COVID-19 situation. 
However, I was happy to see a number of priorities around um, improving ICT and getting a number of young people as interns to the ICT sector uh, to be able to, I guess, support ICT accessibility. But from where I sit, I think there's a long way to go. It's a good start for the government. I would not like thrash or say they're not doing their best. But the key thing at this moment, I would say essentially is the need to safeguard jobs or the need to even increase and provide liquidity relief. And in those cases, I think through what already was offered in form of tax reliefs, but I'm also very keen to encourage advance payments by governments because this is very critical for uh, the suppliers. If we could explore that, that would be very important. I'm still surprised, for instance, that KPLC, which is the monopoly that is providing power services in the country, is registering losses and still cutting electricity and power to people that cannot afford. While we are talking about landlords being able to understand that we may not be able to pay rent, I think the government still has a long way to go in ensuring that people will still need power, whether they are going to work or not, whether they are earning or thing or not. So when you talk about the bigger picture of incentives, it's a good thing. But we need to just look at the smaller things that make a normal human survive. And that is power, that is water, that is liquidity. Um, while I heard that we need, that the government is keen on uh, acquiring about 250,000 desks that are locally fabricated to be able to bring some of these stimulus allocation closer to the people. I ask myself, is this a direct response to the COVID-19 situation where our young children are home for a couple of months? It's almost quarter of a year right now. And I'm like, while we are saying that we want young people, our students and pupils to learn through digital spaces. Do we really think about investing in production of desks as a direct response to a COVID situation? I think not. I, am, I was also a bit disappointed with the allocation that was given to agriculture. Agriculture was given, I think, less than 5 billion, if I look at it. And I'm like, this is a critical demand-driven uh, sector that if I went to my village right now because, for instance, I lost my job due to COVID-19, I would venture into agriculture. And I was hoping that I would see more allocations and more transparency around, not just talking about horticulture sector, but thinking about a typical person that is providing or rather producing some tomatoes, number of crates of tomatoes, vegetables in Kajiado to be incentivized, to be supported by a fund, to be able to continuously provide for their family. And lastly, I was also hoping to see a provision around the innovations that young people are coming up with digitally to try and help you know, the country run, help jobs continue. I was hoping that I would see uh, innovations being incentivized, even taxes probably not being charged on some digital platforms. Unfortunately, the gaps in the stimulus provision were also reflected, in my opinion, negatively in the budget, when the budget was read. Because right now, everybody's moving to the digital space, e-commerce, and digital conversations like this. And if you want to encourage the country to move forward, I think this would have been a moment for us to consider, if not cutting taxes and giving tax relief than just incentivizing those platforms and not deciding to charge taxes on online platforms when you do not have any other option as it is now. Yeah. Thank you, Dio. And, and, and talking about stimulus package, uh, there was some allocation from the government of around 15 billion to tackle youth unemployment. How can these funds be effective in cushioning the youth from the impacts of COVID-19? And while you are at it, there are some programs which have come up out of COVID-19, including Kazim Dani, which has been allocated a huge amount of money in the budget that was read last week on Thursday. What do you need to be done to ensure that these programs or projects are effective 
to reach to the young people of Mashina. This question, a lot of people have been talking in the streets that they haven't seen beneficiaries of Kazi Mudani, for example, and it would be very hard to defend such a statement because they tell you we haven't seen anyone from Kaido Mepoa Kazi who have finally started in Tani. What do you make about all these situations? Here? Uh, Gray, I didn't get every bit of the question. Do you want to just summarize the question? I think you are breaking for a moment. You are breaking for a moment. Just take it one more step so I get it. Sorry, so I was talking about the 15 million allocation stimulus package of youth unemployment, and then there is Kazim Ghani in the budget that has been allocated money, but there are talks among a majority of young people that they are not they have not benefited from this Kazim Ghani. And what does what what makes it different? What do you think in your opinion will make it different? from Kazi Kabijana, for example, in the previous government, or any other programs that have been allocated resources to support young people. Thank you. Um, so I think I briefly alluded to this, and it worries me that in a COVID-19 pandemic, we are typically copy-pasting the Kazi Kabijana that failed. Because I think for me, it's just the same thing. If you're talking about uh, young people coming and clearing bushes, young people coming and uh, clearing towns and roads because it's flooded. I'm like, uh, let's think of it this way. Let's think of 23, 24 year old people that have lost their jobs in these organizations and companies. What is the most relevant way of questioning these persons? I think for me, I'll go back to almost what I mentioned. There are key sectors that will continuously run whether in pandemic or not. And one of them is ICT, of course. The second one is agriculture. And I'm hoping that, I was hoping that when we are talking about providing funds to support young people, I would see an aspect of sustainability. When I talk about sustainability, I mean supporting young people to get into these spaces that are thriving in the pandemic, during the pandemic, and that is ICT, agriculture, um, talent development, I know that you know musicians, as it was, you know, <laughs> loudly announced, were allocated about a hundred million shillings, which would translate to a couple of thousands per individual. But I was also hoping that right now we leverage on talent development, which is an individual activity that could add value to an economy, as as opposed to saying, "Hey, young person, you've lost your job. Come, let's go clear the roads. I give you four hundred and fifty per day." There is no sustainability there for me. And I think we need to redefine the youth in this context. It appears to me like the youth are imagined as casual laborers that may not have necessarily sustainable careers. And I think that strategy needs to be explored and revived, I mean, uh, redefined. Thanks. Thank you, Dio. I want to bring in Sally. Sally, uh, since the pandemic was declared a global pandemic, sorry. And also we've been reporting cases in this country, the government went ahead to give restrictions of movement. Uh, there have been curfews in, uh, across the country and uh, cessation of movement in select counties. We've seen an upside in the numbers of police, police brutality, sorry, I beg your pardon, police brutality across the country. And the IPOA says they have received around 87 complaints, 15 deaths and 31 incidences, which are as a result of COVID-19, when the police are trying to enforce some of these guidelines and regulations. How can officers involved in police brutality cases be held accountable, Sally? So uh, police brutality and excesses are governed by statutes and the constitutions. Huh? So my answer will uh, provide three avenues huh, that can be incorporated when you discuss uh, police brutality. First of all, you have IPOA, established under the Independent Police Oversight Authority Act, Section 6A, that gives uh, its function to investigate complaints brought um, related to disciplinary and criminal offenses by members of the services. It gives directions on how these investigations should be carried out, and once um, they are concluded, how to proceed. Number two, we have the Internal Affairs Unit um, provided for under the National Police Service Act that is monitored, reviewed, and overseen by IPOA, which is another avenue that uh, citizens can use. And number three, we have the Constitutional Petition that is more familiar with Kenyans. Um, the Article 22 of the Constitution 
provides for the Bill of Rights. And once the Bill of Rights um, have been denied, violated, infringed upon, or threatened, the Constitution gives um, a sort of a reprieve to this Kenyan citizen. No? A Kenyan citizen has a right to institute court proceedings. We have one very famous gentleman who's known for doing that, Mr. Okia Omtata goes to court under Article 22 of the Constitution. You can also, as a Kenyan citizen, do the same. You can act on behalf of another person who, is, um, who cannot act on their own. You can act on behalf of a group of people, what we usually call class actions. And any matter that touches on public, um, public issues, eh? you can approach the court under public interest investigation. And uh, let, me, let, me, let me look at another angle. Once you're arrested by a policeman, what are your rights? Article 49 provides for the rights of an arrested person, which is one article that I implore Kenyans to be familiar with. The law is very clear, again, on the procedures to be used. I'll keep using that statement a lot. It actually is very clear on how the measures, the measures and obligations huh, to be followed. Number one, an arrested person has rights. Your rights do not end just because you've been arrested by a police officer. And we have just covered that a police officer also, a member of the service, is answerable to a body. We've covered the IPOA and the Internal uh, um, Affairs um, Unit and the Constitution Petition under Article 22. So Article 49 gives the right of arrested person. Number one, once you've been arrested, you have a right to be informed promptly in a language that you understand. We don't all speak the same language with Kenyans. So the policeman must tell you, inform you in a language that you understand, one, the reasons for arrest, why you have been arrested, um, you have been, uh, the right to remain silent, what you usually call the Miranda rights, and the consequences of not remaining silent. And uh, you have a right to communicate to any other person or preferably an advocate. Advocates are very important. Eh? And uh, you have a right to not make any confession or admission of guilt. And once you choose to make a confession, the confession must be voluntary. Uh, nobody should kick you around and force you to admit to things that you really have not done. That is your right as a Kenyan. No? Um, you have a right to be brought to court uh, within a reasonable time, usually 24 hours. And in some circumstances, the 24 hours, um, it's not possible to produce a person uh, to court within 24 hours. That sh must be explained in a court of law. And once you first appear in court, you have a right to be charged and inform the reasons for detention. Why are you there? And lastly, you have a right to be released on bond or bail as a Kenyan citizen, depending on the conditions. Huh? Of course, there, there are some circumstances. Don't be a flight risk, don't pose a danger to society, among other things to be considered. But you do have a right to pay and bond. This is, uh, we are, we are, we're now um, acting under the assumption that now you've been arrested. So these are your rights, Article 49. So kindly Kenyans, let us be familiar with Article 49. Um, you can also in your own free time check Article 28 and 29 on uh, abuse of authority by members of, uh, of service, that being uh, the policemen. Huh? So for now, allow me to just cover that um, to end on that there, but I will build up on that as we continue. Thank you, Sally. I want to bring in Dio briefly on the same issue. Dio, you've been working with uh, a majority of young people and we've been together in most of these forums. And the issue of police brutality, like in Nairobi specifically, mostly young people are the ones who are being targeted and uh, mostly those who come from informal settlements. And you find that in an informal settlement, say for example, let me say informal settlement X, or uh, let's say Mukuru, for example, a young person meeting a police officer, that sounds like a death sentence to you. You have to run away for your dear life or else you'll be a statistic. Where is the problem and what do you think needs to be done? Deal. Thank you. I think um, I loved when we had uh, in the previous regime, the police national, the police national force being revamped into the police national service. That was on paper and in strategic conference meetings, a very good uh, stride to undertake as a, a government and a nation. However, I feel like on paper, it's a service. On the ground, we still have a long way to go in preparing our policemen to realize that they are serving the country, just like our members of parliament and everyone else. 
and we all pay our civil servants from our efforts. When I sell that fruit as a young person in Mukuru, and I'm able to gain a couple of coins and I pay my taxes. If you ask me where I think the problem is, I think the root cause lies in the whole process of recruitment and training and preparing this person. Are we, I'm not sure they're being prepared to serve. I think they're being prepared to force things to go down people's throats. And so that I think could be a challenge. Secondly, this I may not be sure, but Sally has said that the law you know, is also applicable on both sides. And this means that as a citizen, I have both a right and a responsibility. And even the policeman has a right and a responsibility. I'm just not sure if our policemen are aware of law and if it's part of their course in preparing them to manage our law practically. So for me, I would say it in two ways. We young people that feel we have gotten an opportunity to be exposed and learn, have a responsibility, just like Sally is doing today here, to teach our fellow young persons on areas of law that would make sense. Because practically speaking, the police is a force with a service as a headline. And so if I meet a police person and I'm also producing force, it appears to me that that is what they are trained to do, to manage force. Secondly, even if I was to quote a constitutional, excuse me, a constitutional clause when I'm being arrested, I think as a country, we have a long way to go in managing that. So yeah, it's, it's teamwork for me. Thanks, Bray. Thank you, Dio. I have a lot of questions at the back of my head about police brutality, but topic for another day. Let me bring in Albert. Albert, so far we have surpassed the 3,000 mark of reported COVID-19 cases in the country. There are a lot of cases of stigmatization that have been reported by people who have previously been affected by the virus as they get reintegrated into the society. How can the society be more accepting? And what do you think needs to be done? Albert. Uh, thank you very much, Mara, for the question. Uh, before I answer you, I'd like to say this. I think this is where the community health volunteers or community health workers, as they're known, will really come in. Because these are the people who will actually, be, who will actually interact with these people once they come back to the, to the community. So community health volunteers, community health workers, here's where you come in. Now back to your question. Um, number one, you need to educate yourself on COVID. Number one, know what COVID is. You know, know what it is, what causes it, symptoms, all. Which leads me to my next point. As you do that, you'll be rid of your own biases and prejudices about the same. The third thing, educate others. Go out and sensitize other people, okay? The first thing, you need to now talk with the community health volunteers, as I'd mentioned. Purpose to engage them, because right now they're doing so much work. You know, seek out, people or other community leaders and engage with them. So as, uh, as, as a person, as a people, there's need to do that. The other thing, there's need to offer support and encouragement to these people, okay? There's need for confidentiality for some of these people who, who will test positive, okay? There's need for even reassurance of security by the security personnel. Uh, because I know one thing uh, by that many of these people who, who, who test positive uh, face, I know one of the key one of the key dangers is physical violence. So there's also need to also engage the security. All right. So there's that uh, among many other approaches that we can actually utilize. Thank you. I see a lot of feedback from our viewers on Facebook. I'll be going through them in a in a in a moment. Uh, or I can just go through them. So Baraza Oliver has a question for Sally. Sally, I know you're still with us here. Uh, allow me to read. He says that, uh, my question to Sally, with the heavy burden of court cases in the labor courts, he talks about the labor courts, what are other alternatives a person can pursue to ensure that his employer pays in his due since I got one now up to, I got one up to now, has failed to pay over 
500, I don't know what that means, but he says, I tried Courtway, but it's not working. Maybe it go, it's gonna take three years before my case is had. Sally, what 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 is the problem that we are having in the in the court that we that people may even shy away from filing cases or seeking justice from the courts? And what do you think, in your opinion, needs to be done in a minute, Sally? Okay, I will answer that quite briefly because I'm not privy to the terms and conditions in that particular person's contractor, employment contractor, I will say as that as a person, you must be aware of your rights. Before signing that contract, you must really review it. The terms and conditions. For there to be a termination of contract, the due process is clearly stipulated in the Employment Act. Section 41, I will invite you to, I will invite that particular person to interrogate that particular section. No? It is, I think, a global, um, complaint about the court process. But I will, I can stand here and really assure Kenyans that the judiciary has incorporated um, measures to really spearhead and fast track matters in court. We have, uh, the judiciary rather, has really embraced e-technology. Filing of matters nowadays is electronic. Is it rather, rather electronic? Cases are had through Skype and Zoom. And this really helps in clearing backlog. Thirdly, should you have any complaint that touches on employment issues, uh, I've already explained which court to go to, number one. Number two, there's this statute of limitation. You have to institute these proceedings um, in a specific period. That is three years for anything that touches on employment. Uh. So if anyone has a complaint about anything touching on employment and labor relations, you have between that time where the contract is terminated up to three years. You know, the court, uh, the law is, is created like that to really deter mischief, uh, deter waste of court's time, you know, uh, deter backlog cases, among other things. Eh? So as a Kenyan citizen, you must be aware of your rights, number one. You must be aware of the contents of your contracts, number two. And I will invite that person to maybe share more about the matter with you. Then you can, I can, you can share that with me, then I'll be able to advise more. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. I want to bring in Dio. Dio, there's a question here for you. Actually, it's a comment. Doka Sochur says, these two million packages that the president gave a few weeks ago, how will this money reach the intended purpose, especially the money allocated to the youth, who is keeping checks and balances, and who is to be held accountable should the money disappear in thin air? As you respond to that, Dio, you had earlier talked about agriculture as a sector that needs to be looked into. And right now, uh, agriculture has been affected. And I was watching the news that, uh, which county was that Migori, they don't have supplies because they depended on Tanzania, for example, and the border has been closed. What do you think can be done in the future or currently to support the affected people from these sectors, agriculture, and even hospitality, where a majority are young people? Dear. Thanks, Gray. Um, I think as, a, as that, is it a gentleman or a lady who asked the question on, um, I guess, transparency and accessibility of the funds? This question is being asked by everybody. And if I take a step back, the same way we are having 250 million Kenya shillings being disbursed every week on paper, and hopefully a few people receiving, I think for me, it goes back to the responsibility of the government to clearly, you know, publicly tell us how this process is being undertaken. And when I say that, I mean, uh, I've heard in some quarters people saying the chiefs are identifying the needy, and then they are submitting the names. I've heard in some quarters people saying you need to know your chief one-to-one, -one. maybe, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better word, bribe them to be able to push for your name. But then, I still haven't seen a guideline publicly from the government or from whoever is leading this as an authority showing how this whole process is being transparently managed. So I think for me, there's a lot of need for the government to invest in promotion of public awareness, especially in rural areas where people do not have internet. Like without internet access, some of this information is practically not available and people do not even know that they are supposed to be either getting support or getting funding. And right now, I mean, on the, on the 200,000 people that are young persons that are supposed to apply for these jobs, this is also happening online. So I think there is need for coordination between the central government and the local authorities to ensure that this is achieved. 
And for us who know this information, let us use the, the simplest of platforms, including our social media platforms, to actually get this information to the most needy people. Thank um, you, Dio. You about... Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> finish, finish your point, please. So I think you talked about agriculture briefly, and um, I think for me, this is an opportunity for us to identify gaps and opportunities. Gaps in the sense of Kenya is spending billions of money importing eggs, for example, when some people are selling eggs even at five shillings because they really cannot have a market, or some or Kenyans are actually rearing chicken. So for me, I get disturbed when a county or a section of the country is not having food because they were importing and they have land. I think this is the only opportunity, as I said before, where I would see the government invest in sectors that can run even during the pandemic, as opposed to saying uh, we want 600 million shillings to buy locally manufactured cars. And I kept asking myself, how many young people are actually running you know, car assembly plants? So I think agriculture is a section where there's an opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dio. I want to bring in Albert as we wrap up and then I'll go through some of the comments on Facebook. Albert, kids are at home right now and it looks like they are here to stay for some time up to September, probably. <laughs> How should parents assist their kids in coping up with this pandemic? Because kids just hear coronavirus, they are, they are just being told wear masks, uh, they're being told sanitize. How, 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 how should parents assist their kids during this pandemic? Albert, briefly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, number one, they need to first of all understand COVID. Number one, have a good understanding of COVID, its transmission, to its prevention, and ETC, very important. Then the second thing will be the messaging. Because then again, when it comes to children, children are are diverse, meaning the age group. So it must be targeted messaging. So it is important for that to happen. The other thing they need to do, consequently, they need to, be, they need to keep on talking, you know, having conversations with them around how they are feeling right now and also around, the, around their understanding about the, the, this pandemic. Then the other thing they need to do, they need to develop some form of, you know, a routine. You know, children, they need some form of structure to be able to operate and work. Because remember, uh, regardless, there's still there's an element of balance, which means uh, psychological, physical, and emotional. So there's need for that balance also. Thirdly, they should also encourage them to also exercise, you know, go out and, you know, engage. Other than uh, have a walk, run, you know. Again, have a good diet, you know, eat well. Uh, connect with your friends, you know? So those are some of the things that uh, parents can do to, you know, especially right now as the children in the house right now. Yeah. Thank you, Albert. I'll read a few comments and then I'll give all of your time to give your final remarks as we conclude. Oliver here says that he's talking about police reforms. He says that, uh, I think it's a question to Sally. Do you think we need much police reforms that must be addressed to solve police brutality? Because Ipo has done less than I expect to serve justice to people who have undergone uh, police brutal brutality, sorry, or our courts are delaying, are delaying justice. Yvonne Kuria says that so true, Dio. She agrees with you about the issue of Kazi Kwavijana. She says it's a copy of Kazi. She says Kazi Mitani is a copy of Kazi Kwavijana that failed. And we, the youth, are mostly viewed by the government as casual laborers. Uh, Oliver says, we've criminalized poverty. That's why young people in informal settlement face a lot of police brutality. And then Angela says, excellent presentation by panelists. Thank you. Stigmatization is one of the biggest barriers to us preventing community transmission of COVID-19. We need to look into a different approach on how we address this issue. Just like HIV and AIDS, we have the biggest, we have a biggest burden to reduce transmission. Those are some of the comments coming from Facebook. And to bring you in, Sally, as we conclude, one of our viewers here talks about reforms in the police, <laughs> police service, police force, police service. What do you yeah. think needs to be done and what are your final thoughts on this discussion that we've had today about navigating the tough times that are with us due to COVID-19, especially for young people? Sally. I will start, uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I will start with the issue of police reforms. Huh? Uh, we watch our news uh, every single day and we say that it's a global issue. We have demonstrations all over the world. 
that was sparked by police brutality and use of excessive force. So it's quite a global issue. And uh, I agree with the viewer that we urgently need police reforms, number one, and we urgently need reforms in our judicial system that matters can be filed and heard in a timely manner and justice cannot only be seen to be done, that justice will actually be done. Number two, um, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, in these times, in this crisis, in this pandemic, uh, we have started feeling the economic implications uh, and times are expected to get hard. So I would like to implore to any person of position, or rather I'd like to implore to the government, uh, to really protect its citizen, not only from the economic uh, implications, but to really protect its citizens from human rights violation. And for the Kenyan citizens, I would like to remind you that ignorance of the law is really not a defense. We need to, we need to know our rights. We really need to know our rights as anchored in the Constitution of Kenya 2010. So there's one reprieve that I will give our viewers today. Should you be in need of um, rather legal redress huh? the, and you're unable to afford an advocate, there are certain institutions as a human rights lawyer that I've worked with over the years in my five years experience, both locally and internationally. I will mention them quite fast yeah, with your permission. You can go to, if it's family related, family law related issues, I would really advise you to go to FIDA or CREDO. They're very good in, in uh, handling family law issues and child matters. If it's anything to do with uh, convincing land rights and such things, I will advise you to go to Kitocha Sharia. If it's human rights violation, you have kind of Human Rights Commission. And in any case, you can go to my former place of employment, which is Law Society of Kenya, which has a whole department that is dedicated to public interest matters, human rights and legal aid to an indigent person. I will try to explain that an indigent person, that there are requirements for you to be given uh, pro bono. Not just anyone is qualified for that. Should we give it to every Kenyan, then lawyers will go home hungry and we want Sally to come here next time eh, and pay her rent, among other things. Eh? You need to prove that you're an indigent person. An indigent person is one that cannot afford legal services. So should you fall under that category, those are the institutions that you should go to. But if you can't afford a lawyer, please, there's so many lawyers everywhere, walk into someone's office, they will be able to guide you accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. I want to bring in Albert. Albert, uh, your final comments and also what should we do moving forward in this pandemic? Because clearly it's here with us for quite some time. What should people do at home, young people specifically, uh, to, to go through this? Albert. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll end by saying this. I think uh, generally for everybody, and I think especially for young people, what I like to really emphasize is the aspect of resilience. We just have to be resilient because, um, as it's very clear, this pandemic has really disrupted so many things, and most so economics, which mostly affects young people. So it is very important to be able to handle this at this particular point in time. What does that require? It requires people not to become to identify maybe their hobbies or their skills or things that they love. So they need to become more innovative, more creative, and um, I think when you do that that will be very key. Another thing, it will also be very important for young people to connect, go out to get to connect, to engage with people, because, uh, you know, once you're quarantined uh, as a person or people, you know, you have got so many emotions and feelings that you're going through. So it's very important to do that. Another thing I'll emphasize so much on is that aspect of self care please because if you don't take care of yourself then you can't take care of anyone else and, and when it comes to self-care i once again i really emphasize the fact that if you have to be very deliberate about it you must be very intentional when you in short when you wake up you know what you're going to do that will give you order and also remember as much as the pandemic as much as we're in a lockdown guess what life is going on so life is not going to stop for you so you need to plan, you still need to figure out uh, maybe your goals and your ambitions and your visions for your life. I think it's a very good time. And you figure out how to execute them, um, add and subtract if you may, when necessary. And also, I also want to bring the aspect of spiritual intelligence here. Uh, you cannot ignore that. I know can being mostly a Christian uh, country, always 
always fall back to prayer because prayer is going to guide you through and to get us through this pandemic. And one more thing I may just emphasize, this pandemic is here to stay for a while. So we need to, as people are saying, the new normal, it may be here for a very long time, just like the flu or cold viruses. So we need to now adjust and adapt to it. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Dio, your final thoughts and your what young people watching yeah. us Great. out here. Thank you. Out there. Thank you. I think I will say it in three ways. One is we have a very uh, robust, experienced uh, national COVID-19 response team, STIACO. I just think their role is not or should not only be to feed the country and say those that are struggling should be fed. I think they should also take up the role of economic recovery. And through public-private partnerships, we need to see the country being driven towards new strategies for new opportunities in business that would stand in the, you know, in, this, in the current pandemic situation so that then the young people are learning from even the, you know, the strategic team. Secondly, is to just say that there lies great opportunities in this pandemic. And as we cry every time and think we are losing it and things are going wrong, some of us are thinking of how to liberate the existing gaps that never existed before. So my word to the young people, when you hear of a county or a region suffering because they were importing food, that is an opportunity. And I think it's time for us to, as Albert has said, embrace partnerships and fr embrace friendships and make all these friendships uh, productive. I can see an opportunity and I don't have resources. Let me speak to somebody who can help me and together we can leverage on this pandemic opportunities to be greater. And lastly, just thanks. Let's keep these conversations going because they're also very helpful. I think today I've spoken to four people and I'm all alone in my house. So this is helpful. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> thank you, Dio. Thank you, Dio, for ending it that way. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who has watched this conversation on our Facebook page and for giving in your comments and thoughts. For those that we could not read, we apologize, but we thank you for joining us. We look forward to having this discussion some other time. My panelists, Sally Mambo, Thank you very much for joining us this wonderful afternoon and spending the hour with us. And also, Albert Nigoa, thank you for joining us this evening. And also, dear gracious Magero, Santa Sana, uh, lady and gentlemen. We have to end it there. I want to wish you a wonderful evening and let's keep engaging. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.